Hi, thank you very much for coming on such a lovely night when you could have gone out for a stroll. I've been raving about the weather to my children who are in the East Coast and survived the storm. <laughs> um, I don't want to spoil the stories in the book, uh, but I want to tell you why I wrote the book. Um, in 2005, about uh, a year, uh, a little bit before the presidential election that led to the election of uh, President uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, I went to see a reformist uh, journalist. He um, was close to the reformist camp. Uh, the pres President Khatami uh, had already served his two terms as president, and he couldn't run again. And the future of reform depended on uh, if the reformists could come up with a viable candidate who could attract the people's vote. I spoke to this gentleman, and I didn't get a sense that they, they had a good candidate in mind. I was quite disappointed, but before leaving, I had learned to put away my notebook, my pen, and just sit there for another cup of tea. And as we were talking, I don't remember what he said, but he mentioned the name of the Shah and Reza Shah, um, the king of the country who was overthrown by the 1979 revolution, and his father. Um, I just dismissed both of them as dictators. Uh, I had been nine years old at the time of the revolution, and this is uh, what I had learned at school. The revolutionaries, uh, the Islamic regime, uh, they both, I mean, they all had taught us that the Shah and his fathers were dictators. Uh, but I wasn't prepared for this uh, journalist's uh, reaction. He snapped at me angrily, and he said that I didn't know my history, um, that both the father and the son had uh, set the foundation for modern Iran. And he started going on and on and on, talking about what great things they had done. I was completely um, caught off guard, uh, not because I hadn't heard the conversation. I had heard it from ordinary Iranians all along. Um, a lot of people were disillusioned with what happened after the revolution. Uh, and so everybody, ordinary Iranians, always talked about the good days before the revolution. Um, and uh, one of the earliest assignments uh, that I had for the New York Times was to go to bookstores and ask people what books they were buying. And it turned out that some of the best sellers were books about the royal family. It seemed that people were curious uh, to read about what they had done, the, the father and the son, and what was happening to their family now in exile. Um, but this gentleman, the, the independent journalist, he had been a staunch supporter of Khomeini in 1979. And more so, he had been the head of a police force called Komite in those days that were responsible for rounding up people who opposed Khomeini and the Islamic regime. And a lot of these people landed in prison and were executed. And this guy had also been a member of the Revolutionary Guard, the force that uh, Khomeini set up after the revolution to safeguard the revolution. And the force had fought in the war with Iraq and made huge sacrifices. So I didn't expect a man who had made such big sacrifices and had gone to such measures uh, to talk against some of the values that he had fought for. But then he said something that made total sense. He said, we fought for political freedom. But what happened after the revolution, we lost our personal freedoms too. And this made total sense to me because I had been nine years old at the time of the revolution. And even as a young girl, I felt that. After the revolution, I had to wear a headscarf. I had to wear a long, loose coat, and I had to wear pants underneath it. None of us, none of the girls, could decide the color or even the material of these clothes. The regime insisted that the material had to be nylon because cotton looked nicer and sometimes stuck to the body. Um, and the other thing that had been very close to my heart had been a swimming pool that we had in our housing complex. Uh, it was not a private pool. It was one that 400 families shared. And the pool had been the center of our lives, all the kids. We swam in the pool all summer, and then we went and played snow in the pool. But after the revolution, uh, the Islamic regime banned girls from swimming in the pool. They said they couldn't wear uh, 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 their bathing suits and appear in public. 
So we sat there around the pool um, in our headscarf coats, um, watching the boys enjoy the water. And of course, the boys couldn't uh, swim for a long time either. They had to stop using the pool by the age of 16 when they reached puberty too. Um, so, I mean, part of the book talks about the evolution of the revolutionaries, how uh, many of the many of the revolutionaries who had taken part in founding the Islamic regime changed over the years. And uh, they started calling for changing the system, reforming the system, because uh, they, they were disillusioned with what happened. Uh, but there are also a lot of cliches and stereotypes about Iran, about Iranians. When I left the country in 2009, after the uprising, um, I, I came across a lot of cliches about Iran. People asked me what happened. Uh, millions of people came out on the streets. How come they weren't able to achieve anything? Uh, how come they didn't stay out there on the streets until they could overthrow the regime? Uh, when um, a, one woman was killed, and um, I'm sure you know her, Leila Agha Sultan, she became the face of the uprising. Um, my editors asked me to write about her and the link to martyrdom. And I, I was quite uh, surprised by the idea myself. I mean, I didn't know what was the link between martyrdom and um, her death. As far as I knew, not, nobody wanted to get killed. Uh, nobody glorified death or martyrdom, not even during the war with, uh, with Iraq. People went to fight uh, to defend their country, but they didn't go with the intention to get killed. And I had learned that lesson in 1999 when for the first time, uh, the largest protests erupted around the country. Uh, students had been angry over the closure of an independence daily. Uh, they had started staging protests at, at their dormitory at night. And one night, pro-government forces attacked the dormitory, beat up the students, killed one uh, young man, and injured many, many others. The attack angered the student community around the country and for a week, uh, students and also a lot of people poured out on the streets demonstrating against the regime. They were the largest in the country, partly because students have a great network uh, in every city and they could mobilize uh, people uh, behind themselves. And of course, the regime came out with an iron fist and managed to crack down the protests um, after a week. Uh, it jailed many of the leaders uh, many of them were tortured and uh, spent a long time in prison. I met one of these le leaders about six, seven months uh, after he had spent time in prison. Uh, he wasn't in a very good shape. He had spent a long time in solitary confinement, which is used as a kind of torture. Um, but he had resumed his activism again. I saw him with a colleague who had covered the revolution, Iranian revolution, in 1979. And uh, she had studied um, revolutions, the American Revolution and the French Revolution. While we were interviewing this student leader, my colleague turned around and asked the student leader if, if his, he was willing to die for freedom. Um, the leader was quite shocked. For a few minutes, he just looked at her to see if the question was serious. And then he said, no. He said, I'm fighting for a better life. Why would I want to die? When we walked out, my colleague told me that she was very disappointed with the student movement. She said that if there were not people who, who were willing to die, to sacrifice uh, their lives for, for revolution and for change, nothing would happen. She said this was uh, true uh, in the beginning of the Iranian revolution and also during the French and the American revolution. I was quite intrigued by her position. And so I started asking people. I mean, whenever I interviewed activists or um, uh, journalists uh, who were quite active, I asked them, I mean, are you willing to die for democracy? Is martyrdom on your agenda? Nobody told me yes. Uh, I never came across anyone who was willing to die. And so this myth that uh, Iranians, because they are Shiite Muslims, they fought in the war with Iraq, they are willing to die and become martyrs. Is, I mean, it was not true. 
So in 2009, when millions of people came out, I, I mean, it was amazing. It was the first time that such great numbers of people had poured out, and they kept coming out in solidarity, uh, and they were not intimidated by the violence the, that the regime was using against them. But I knew, I knew that they wouldn't stay out there and shed blood for change. And if you remember, the protesters withdrew from the streets in 2010, about six months after the uprising. 150 people were killed. Um, a year later, uh, the Egyptians had their own uprising. Um, and um, within a couple of weeks, they managed to overthrow Mubarak. Uh, several hundred people were killed. Uh, the Egyptians called their revolution a peaceful revolution. The Iranians, to this date, are calling their, uh, what happened in Iran as bloody crackdown. Um, and, and people know the names of the people who were killed. They know uh, their biographies. Uh, they have become icons. Um, and that doesn't mean that um, uh, the, the values are different. But I think uh, that shows how Iranian society has changed. Uh, uh, they have gone through things in the past 35 years has changed their, that has changed their perspectives. Um, when Mubarak uh, fell, his government fell, I thought Iranians would be envious. Uh, but I, I saw that on social uh, network, uh, uh, the, the, the social networking media, uh, people were leaving interesting comments. They were saying, well, congratulations, we wish you luck. Uh, we were there 35 years ago. Uh, democracy is a process. It's going to take time. Uh, and it reminded me of uh, what Iranians have gone through. I mean, in 1979, we had a revolution that was quite bloody. Uh, after uh, the victory of the revolution, Khomeini hijacked the revolution and started rounding up whoever opposed him, and many people were executed. I belong to a generation uh, that remembers uh, that violence. Uh, Two-thirds of the population was born after uh, the revolution. Uh, if they haven't heard the stories from their parents, many of them have had um, parents who died uh, in the beginning of the revolution. And many people died in the war with Iraq. It, it dragged on for eight years. Um, um, at that time, we called it the longest uh, war. There are, we, we've had longest wars since then. But eight years is quite a long time, and um, Iranians remember the war very well. Uh, when you go to Iran, memories of that uh, war loom everywhere. There are murals of people who were killed, uh, a constant reminder of what uh, war can bring, nothing but death and destruction. And I think uh, all those things have helped Iranians to become very uh, reluctant to any kind of uh, activity that entails uh, institutional breakdown. Uh, they, they know that institutional breakdown uh, brings about insecurity. And at times like that, radicals like Khomeini can hijack the situation. Um, and that um, the reform, real reform, needs to come slowly. Uh, the revolution uh, and the Islamic regime uh, have enforced policies that have created some fundamental changes in Iranian society. Uh, none of them were the intended policies, but they have helped transform Iranian society quite profoundly. Uh, you look at the numbers, and more than 70% of the population lives in the cities now. Uh, more than 70% of the population is considered middle class, including lower middle class, uh, uh, looking at people who have incomes of over $3 a day. Iran has uh, oil revenue, and that oil revenue has been injected into society among people, especially over the past decade. Uh, since Ahmadinejad came to power, he kept his populist uh, promises and did distribute the oil money among people through handouts. Um, and education levels, they have increased tremendously. Um, the population under the age of 24 is almost 99 point something percent illiterate. Illiteracy is non-existent among the population of that age. Uh, women have been going to universities in increasing numbers. More than half of university students have been women since 2000. Uh, by 2009, 62% of university students were women. 
I mean, this shows that Iranian society um, has more educated women uh, than men. And if you want to change a society, change their women. Uh, they raise the next generation. And um, so, I mean, this is not a society that is willing to make serious sacrifices for change. They prefer to uh, take things easy, wait for gradual but long-lasting change, then engage in actions that might lead to uh, similar events like in 1979. When I was covering the protests in 2009, I had a hard time finding a driver who was willing to drive me to downtown Tehran. They were all complaining that they were afraid somebody would throw a rock and scratch their car. If people are not willing to get their car dented, so you can imagine how far they're willing to, to go for democracy. <laughs> and you know, I think the biggest achievement of the uprising in 2009 was that Iranians sent a very loud and clear message uh, to their leaders. Uh, very loudly and very clearly, they said that uh, enough is enough. They want more. They want freedom. And when they realized that they couldn't achieve anything on the streets, they withdrew from the streets. And they came back to the polls in 2013. And again, they didn't have a lot of options. This, you're, we're dealing with a government that screens all candidates for any kind of elections. They had allowed 10 candidates to run. People came out and they said, OK, we're going to vote for the most moderate figure. And of course, when we say moderate figure, none of these people are really moderate. It's just a matter of com comparison. It's, a, it's an alternative between bad and worse. But they went to the polls, and they voted for him. Uh, and they, had, they didn't have much hope that their vote would be counted, because like in 2009, they thought the government is going to steal the election in favor of the establishment's candidate. But they did count the vote. They did count the vote, and the moderate candidate, Hassan Rouhani, got elected. And he was the guy who had campaigned on a platform to, to give more freedom, both social and political freedom, to people and end the crisis with the West over Iran's nuclear program. And it looks like Iranians have learned to take advantage of the opportunities that they get to pour out on the streets and set messages and signals to a regime that doesn't necessarily respond uh, to those messages. But we know now that this regime does hear th these signals. And even though it doesn't respond to them quickly, it does understand them. I think the fact that Hassan al-Rouhani was allowed to become president shows that uh, the regime realized that under increasing international sanctions over Iran's nuclear program, uh, it cannot survive without any support inside the country. It needed to create uh, a minimum uh, support base for itself inside the country. Um, and I want to end with, uh, with the nuclear program because it's, it's the most important issue. Uh, you hear about it all the time on the news. And I don't think it's possible to talk about Iran and not talk about this uh, standoff with the West. Um, I do hope that uh, there's going to be an agreement. Because the sanctions uh, that have uh, just uh, crippled Iranian economy has been hurting Iranian civil society more than the government. The government has access to the petrodollar. Uh, it has become an expert at circumventing uh, sanctions. For the past 35 years, Iran has been under some kind of sanctions on and off. And uh, they have learned how to sell the oil in the black market and cash in. So the government has the kind of uh, cash that it needs to survive. Uh, but it is the civil society, it is Iranian uh, people who have suffered mostly. Um, and there are moderates in Iran, like President uh, Rouhani, who realize that the regime cannot survive uh, under economic pressure. Uh, that they need to develop the country and they need to uh, uh, integrate back into uh, the international community. So there is a will inside the country and huge support for a deal over Iran's, uh, over, a deal, uh, over a deal with the West over the country's nuclear program. 
Uh, however, there are hardliners both here in the United States and Ir in Iran who are very seriously opposed to a kind of deal uh, because both, of, both groups, both uh, radical groups, need some kind of enemy. Iranian hardliners fear that without animosity with the United States, without this whole threat of uh, uh, the West being uh, against Iran's uh, nuclear program, it wouldn't have anything to hold on to power. It's afraid that if there is any kind of rapprochement with the West, the hardliners are going to lose their grip on power. So I will e end here uh, hoping uh, that moderates here and in Iran would be able to reach some kind of agreement because uh, change in Iran has come on grassroots levels. Iranian society has changed profoundly. People have become uh, very uh, educated. They have moved up in society. The middle class is large. This is not a kind of society that would engage in uprisings or revolutions or any kind of action would lead to uh, overthrowing the regime. Uh, this is a cautious society that wants to see gradual uh, but permanent change. Um, and um, in the meantime, uh, they, they consider themselves members of a global uh, 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 culture. They don't consider themselves um, as members of the Islamic Republic uh, since the 1990s when internet and satellite TV have, uh, have come to Iran. They have uh, created a window for Iranians uh, to, to see people's lives beyond Iran, everywhere. You can flip the channels, be in South Korea one minute and another minute be somewhere else, anywhere in Europe. Uh, they have access to hundreds and hundreds of uh, satellite TV channels. So they are yearning, they are, are waiting for, for change. But it is top-down a change that hasn't come to Iran, and that is the slow one. Uh, Iranian leaders have been very resistant to give uh, leeway to any kind of change. Um, however, they are aging. Iran's supreme leader is in his 70s and so are many of his supporters and people in power. One of the amazing things during 2009 uprising was that uh, many people who were arrested, uh, many of them were children of the current leaders. Their names were in newspapers. People had spent time with them in prison. Uh, everybody knew who they were. So um, leaders who have failed to raise their own children according to the ideology uh, that they wanted for the entire nation uh, they probably know that if they want to survive, if they want to keep this current regime in its current form, uh, they, they have to reform it from within and uh, give in to change. Thank you. We're now going to take a few questions. If you could use the microphones on either end of the stage, keep your questions short and in the form of a question. If you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, please do so at the signing table after the Q&A. Thank you for your talk. Could you tease something apart? The, the regime says we're the government, but the regime also says we're the religious leaders. And, and in the West, it's really hard for us to understand that. And, and could it be that at, in some way or form, those two could move away from each other and society would change that way too. Well, you know, it's not just confusing for you, it's confusing for Iranians as well. Uh, because, you know, in the beginning of the revolution, uh, when, especially when Khomeini was alive and he was the charismatic leader, uh, the regime had been able to attract uh, quite a good number of people uh, as its support base and they were all ideologically uh, devoted to Khomeini and uh, his Islamic regime. And behind that ideology was religion. They truly believed that uh, Khomeini was uh, God's man and they had to follow him. Uh, but first of all, as people moved away uh, from their more traditional roots, from their religious roots even, because as they moved up in society, uh, a lot of them changed their minds. Um, they, they stopped seeing uh, Iranian leaders that way. Um, and then by the time Khomeini died in 1989, 
and uh, Ayatollah Khamenei came to power, and he was not an Ayatollah, he was a mid-ranking cleric who was promoted to a more senior position to qualify for such senior posts, uh, things started to change. He started alienating uh, a lot of people who had been close to Khomeini, and they were quite senior in their religious ranks, uh, partly because he wasn't as senior as they were, so he could never uh, uh, get them to respect him. And um, uh, because he felt that, because he knew he would never earn their respect, he started relying on the Revolutionary Guards, the force that Khomeini had cre created after the revolution to support the regime. Um, and you know, I, I would say by 2000, um, there was no secret that um, the, the regime doesn't have a religious support base anymore. It relies on uh, the Revolutionary Guards, which is also in charge of Iran's nuclear program, by the way, and its militia wing, the besiege, comprised of volunteer forces uh, who help crack down uh, on different kinds of events that the regime looks down on. Um, it's enti entirely a regime that relies on quite thuggish uh, uh, characters to go out after its opponents. Um, for I mean, th this is one of the stereotypes about Iran that there is a religious government in power and it is religion that has kept it there. But it's nothing but pretense and Iranians know that. And the interesting thing is that uh, Iranian media is so dynamic and there is that much freedom that they talk about this. They talk about it. They say uh, our supreme leader, who has the final word on uh, state uh, uh, matters, acts like the Shah, what's the difference? I mean, one had a crown and one has a turban. <laughs> uh, we hear a lot about the level of education and the desire uh, for more freedom among young, young Iranians, but we're also given a picture uh, of thousands of young men in uh, madrasas being um, maybe brainwashed uh, to uh, tow the religious line. Um, is that, uh, you, you've almost sort of answered my question ju just now, uh, is that a fairly minor force in, in reality? Well, you know, we have public education in Iran. We don't have uh, uh, those kinds of matrices that you might think of in Pakistan, mm -hmm. and public education is obligatory. Uh, but what we have is that when uh, uh, kids reach the age of uh, I don't know, 14, 15, they become teenagers, they start encouraging them to join the besiege, uh, the volunteer militia force. Uh, and that happens mostly in uh, lower class neighborhoods. Uh, it doesn't work in villages that much. Uh, it's mostly in smaller towns and deprived areas when, where people are in urban areas but are poor and want to move up. Uh, and, the, and the besiege does provide them with an opportunity uh, to go to university, they, they get admission, uh, to, to get jobs at the civil sector, and so uh, have steady income, which is a luxury in Iran. Uh, so th there is good rewards for people to join uh, those. Um, I, I uh, followed a group of them since they were 14, 15, uh, their stories in the book. Uh, it, by the age of like in their early 20s, it didn't even take that long. And they were the kind of people who were going out on the streets and beating up people. They were committed uh, to do their job. Uh, but the, by the time they reached their 20s, early 20s, and they had started university, they began changing. Uh, they began evolving in the same way that the revolutionaries uh, did uh, after 1979. Uh, but yes, you're right. I mean, especially on TV, you see a lot of people at these uh, uh, staged protests chanting death to America. Those were my favorite because I used to go there with American colleagues and often people were busy chanting death to America. And they would turn around, ask me who I was. I would say I'm a journalist and ask about my American uh, 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 co colleague. And when I, they asked, where is she? Where is he from? And, 
every time I said America, they always said, oh, we love America. <laughs> <laughs> can, can she or he help us get a visa? <laughs> Unfortunately, um, they, um, they join. Um, the, I mean, there, are, there have been a lot of reports that they get paid to go. Um, but it doesn't go beyond the words that they chant. With the New York Times, you're part of the elite media, we would say. Can you talk to the controls that are in place in Iran um, when it comes to stories that you'd like to tell? Um, what that story has to go through before it gets to even your editors? Uh, well, you know, even uh, Iranian journalists inside the country, they don't show their, what they write to anyone. Um, there is that much freedom that uh, people write whatever they want to write. And one uh, editor once told me, we have freedom of expression. We don't have freedom after expression. <laughs> so I, you, you take a risk by writing what you want to write. And this is what a lot of Iranian journalists who work for local media do, partly because a lot of them are activists. Um, and they, they've turned to journalism to have a platform to express themselves. So they write a lot of uh, quite bold things, they discuss them, and they see how far they can push the boundaries. And what happens is that a lot of them land in prison. Um, with me, as you said, I, I was in a totally different category, not just me, but uh, all those reporters who worked for foreign uh, media outlets, partly because the regime saw us as a bridge uh, to send messages. Uh, my feeling was that when I started working in the early 1990s, uh, a group of people had come to power that they appreciated my coverage because I was presenting a more human face of Iran. I was not just writing about people who were chanting death to, to America. I was writing about people who were struggling uh, to be themselves, to have their own identities under the Islamic Republic. And that was presenting uh, a human face of Iran and Iranians, and that was a time at, at a time when the regime wanted to uh, be part of the international community, had reached out to Western uh, countries. But there was always things that I knew were red lines. Um, uh, for instance, uh, I never wrote about uh, the Baha'is. Baha'is are, are, are followers of a faith that the Islamic Republic has uh, persecuted since its foundation. Uh, I knew that I could not write about other religious minorities like the Sunnis who are very much discriminated against. Uh, the Sunni areas in the country, uh, the, uh, in southern Iran near the border with Pakistan, uh, the, the Kurdish areas, and even south on, on the border with Iraq are the most underdeveloped areas in the country. I visited those areas and, and it was hard. I mean, I couldn't just travel there. I had to get a special permission but I never wrote about it because uh, it could risk, uh, uh, I could risk losing my credentials to work. Uh, I, I started working for Agence France Press uh, and one of the lessons that I learned there, my, my boss always told me, was, was to work in a way that we could keep the office open. That was more important. To stay and write stories rather, rather than writing one inflammatory uh, story that could cost uh, closing the office, or even for me as a New York Times correspondent, losing my credentials. Um, however, I tried, I, I never wrote a story about persecution of the Baha'is, but if I wrote a story about crackdown, or if I wrote a story about the arrest of student leaders, I, I put a line in there that, by the way, like X number of Baha'is uh, were arrested, or like a Baha'i got a death sentence. So there were ways to maneuver around those restrictions. And every once in a while, I wrote a story that they didn't like. And there were people who called me, they, they intimidated me. And for a period, I would just lay low and not work uh, because it was more important for me to, to stay in the country and keep working rather than uh, trying to uh, sort of outsmart them, get them angry and uh, uh, make things get worse. Hi, thank you for coming. 
Um, my, my question is most of us, including myself for a long time, think of Iran mostly from 79 on. That's when it was thrown at us. But in trying to fill the backstory, I've been aghast at how our government, the CIA, toppled your government in 53, et cetera. So it's a long history. My question is, on whole, do you think our actions have, in some, been more helpful or more hurtful to creating a democratic Iran? 19, are you talking about the 1953 coup or? I'm talking about the 1953 coup as an illustration, but in some, if you look at this century of our involvement, have we been more helpful or more hurtful? And related to that is, if there's one thing you would want to change about our policy toward Iran or the Middle East in general, what would that be? What do we have so wrong that you wish we would correct? Well, the and, list uh, can be long. <laughs> <laughs> so you're blessing. And on a personal note, does your son still go by Jack, or has he taken yes. back his Iranian name? <laughs> no, unfortunately, he still goes by the name Jack. <laughs> I hope that changes. <laughs> Slowly. <laughs> Slowly, yeah. Um, you know, the, lo the list is long. Uh, my list is long. Uh, the regime's list is even longer. Uh, but, you know, there's certain things that people remember. The 1953 coup, when it, the first and only democratic government of Iran was overthrown. And then I think the worst is, uh, for my generation, what we remember is the war. You know, and as time has passed, uh, there has been more information about how uh, the United States helped Saddam to kill Iranians. And the worst came in 1988 when uh, a, uh, an American ship shot down a passenger plane, killing more than 200 civilians. Uh, these are things that uh, people remember. Uh, and, and they're horrible memories. I mean, because uh, Iranians uh, were being oppressed from one side by their regime. We're talking about ordinary Iranians who were on that plane. They were being oppressed uh, inside their own country. Uh, they had to fight a war that they didn't support because Khomeini had wanted to use the war to stabilize the foundations of his regime and was sending these people to defend the country under the name of nationalism. And then in the meantime, uh, they, are, they were getting killed by, uh, with the help of uh, not just America, the United States. I mean. Iranians have a list against the Germans, too, because the chemical weapons that were used against Iranians were provided to Saddam by Germans. Um, so um, there, there is a, a long list of such uh, grievances. Uh, but I think, in general, Iran is the most pro-U.S. country in, in the region. Um, you know, Iranians have had their own share. Um, Unfortunately, the regime has been quite mischievous. It has killed a lot of American soldiers in Iraq. Uh, a lot of uh, um, its involvement in, in Iran's involvement in Lebanon uh, and uh, other part, and there are lots of accusations. So, and a lot of them have not been proven. But Iran has had its own share of uh, spilling American blood. Uh, so I think Iranian people in general have sort of forgotten part of it or they close their eyes on that. And they want to see some kind of rapprochement uh, with the United States. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a matter of forgiveness or they, they look at things realistically. But the truth of the matter is that if you ask any American that has gone to Iran recently, and many have been going uh, since the election of President Rouhani, they, and Anthony Bourdain was one of them. They, they tell you that they were struck by the hospitality, how nice people were, and uh, they constantly invited um, people into their home. And they, they usually don't invite everybody. They like to invite Americans. <laughs> so I'm sure that you know today there was an attack in Israel by Hezbollah. And um, Hezbollah is being supported by Iran. I'm wondering how this moderate populace that you've described feels about what's happening, about the support of Hezbollah, and about what's happening in the whole Middle East, given how volatile it is, particularly at the moment. Uh, well, as you know, um, 
In the past 35 years, the Islamic regime has been able to create uh, quite efficient uh, arms for itself in the region. It's not just Hezbollah that Iran supports. Iran ha supports the Shiites in, um, in Iraq, it supports groups in Afghanistan. Uh, in Yemen, it, it supports the Houthis. Uh, uh, and you know, the interesting thing is, uh, as, Amer as the United States and other Western countries have tried to contain Iran's uh, sort of reach in the, in the region, uh, Iran has moved on. It has become more and more uh, competent in creating uh, these groups that are uh, 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 helping Iran's interest and uh, expanding Iran's influence in the region. Look at Syria. Um, but you know, there is one thing that you should remember, that is, uh, Iran is very much a divided country. Iran is divided between conservative forces uh, and moderate forces. How much moderate forces are allowed in those decisions, we don't know. Uh, as far as uh, they have said, they have claimed that they have never been involved in those decisions, they have always been against them, and they have been used to undermine them. Uh, this started under the presidency of uh, President Khatami uh, in 2003, when Iranians were helping American forces in Afghanistan, Iranian forces were moving inside uh, Afghanistan with the coalition forces, with the Afghan forces, helping to overthrow the Taliban. Uh, and then from the other side, there were some uh, Revolutionary Guards forces uh, who were sabotaging these efforts and uh, they were making things difficult for the Americans. Uh, so this is part of the same argument that the moderates need to be uh, empowered. If, if the West engages the moderates, uh, they will have uh, an upper hand and it will encourage them to craft policies that would be responsible, responsive to international demands. Uh, uh, and one thing that you, you should not forget was just a few, uh, about two weeks ago, Israel attacked uh, Hezbollah, it, it killed Ahmad Mohniya's son, and in that group was an Iranian Revolutionary Guard commander a very senior one. Uh, and it, I mean, the first thing I thought when I read the news today was that this was a retaliation. Uh, they were retaliating. Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, it's a proxy war, and Iran has its arm uh, present everywhere to retaliate. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm curious about um, the middle class that we've been talking about tonight in terms of personal religion and personal religiosity, not the kind of politicized, you know, moderate and not and conservative. And did you, did your reporting lend you any information on this? As I mean, the Iranians I meet here are distinctly secular. Um, they'll say they're a Muslim, but they're not faith-based. They're, they're not faithful as one might consider when you look at America, which is extremely religious, albeit not monolithic. I'm just curious what the middle class is and you know, what their views, what their personal belief is. Um, that's such an interesting question. You know, it was a puzzle for me too when I was even in Iran. Uh, you know, religion is a very personal thing. And as you said, Iranians appear quite secular, but I'm not sure how secular they are. Um, uh, I mean, I, I I look at my own mother. My mother looks very secular, but she's also very religious. But religion for her is a very personal thing. And I think this is uh, how it is for many Iranians. And this was how it was before the revolution, until the revolutionaries came and they wanted to publicize everything about religion. If you were a good Muslim, you had to go to the Friday prayers. Uh, if you were a good Muslim, you had to fast in public. A lot of people used to fast and never talked about it. A lot of people used to pray and never, they never did it in, in public. If they missed their prayer, they went home and prayed twice. Uh, they, they, they developed their own relationship with God and uh, their way of uh, uh, dealing with, with him. I mean, I remember my mom had a cousin who always wore nail polish. And uh, Muslim clerics say that if if you pray and if you have nail polish on, on, on your nails, your prayer is no good. Uh, 
My mom's cousin always said that I have talked to God and he has given me permission. <laughs> so I think it's a little bit hard to gauge people, people's religiosity. Uh, the government claims that people have become less secular. Mosques are always empty. Uh, you never uh, find Iranians uh, shutting down their uh, shops at the time of prayer at noon and flocking to the local mosque or somewhere to pray together. This is something you see in a lot of Arab countries. But in Iran, you don't see that. Uh, it might be a different kind of way, uh, way of uh, being religious, or perhaps Iranians are becoming less religious. But you know, the other thing is that also that uh, Iran is definitely uh, a society that is in transition. It has moved from being a society that was very rural, a very traditional, to becoming a bit middle class, uh, educated, and very urban. And societies like that usually act in different ways, and they might show other characteristics. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Iranians suddenly become more religious in 10 years from now. Um, but the, the, the government complains about this. It says that kids don't go to prayers. Uh, kids don't respect a lot of uh, religious values that their parents did. Hi, thank you so much. My name's Joe. Um, I'm very blessed to have been able to travel to 80 countries around the world. And just this year, I went to Iran. It is one of the most magical, fantastic countries I've ever been to in my 80 countries of travel and the people there are absolutely the friendliest and most hospitable in all my travels. You mentioned one thing about the death to America chance, how they're just words, but when that gets transferred over to our media, then it becomes more than words because our media portrays it as something different. But that's not, the question I had was more, can you speak a little bit more about the, you keep mentioning the international community. And on one hand, we have US and Israel, which feel very strongly and sanctions are gonna continue. Who else in the international community is helping Iran or are they ignoring trade sanctions that the US and Israel put up and they're helping via trade and oil exports and so on? Um, to be very specific, uh, most European countries complied uh, with the sanctions. And when I was saying uh, for Iran's, this, talking about Iran's desire to be part of the international communities, to be accepted and be able to trade, uh, to do all kinds of trades uh, with Western countries, also Eastern countries, India and uh, China. Uh, so, uh, but, but you know, unfortunately, uh, Iran looks mostly at West rather than East. I mean, its interest in East is strategic, of course. Uh, but, um, um, what, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what Iran did to circumvent the sanctions uh, was mostly through buying banks, uh, becoming partners uh, at different uh, economic centers, including a lot of smaller banks, and not only in, in neighboring countries, but they went as far as Malaysia, a uh, lot of country in Indonesia, and those countries, uh, th those connections helped them to circumvent the, the sanctions. And there, were, there have been a lot of other stories uh, that uh, became public. Uh, Iran had partners in Italy uh, that, what, that uh, who were helping revolutionary guards get uh, spare parts for military equipment, for heli military helicopters, uh, and God knows what else. Uh, and Iran was using those contacts for years and years uh, until uh, the Italian uh, team got into trouble. There might be more. Hi. Uh, with all the inflammatory comments and news reports on uh, in the United States, can you shed a little bit of... Uh, clarity on the relationship between Iran and the Israeli state, maybe from the standpoint of, uh, of the ground, uh, the people at grassroots level? Uh, well, you know, animosity towards Israel has been one of the uh, foundations of uh, the regime. Uh, 
the other two foundations. One of them is how women are dressed. Women have been uh, uh, representing the Islamic Republic. I mean, if Iranian women are not dressed the way they are, uh, they could be uh, living anywhere in the world. Uh, you can't tell that this is Iran. And the third one has been animosity towards uh, the United States. So it has been one of the uh, integral principles that has defined the regime. Uh, and it has gone to extreme lengths to, to make sure that uh, this animosity uh, goes deep into society. But like many other things, it has failed. Uh, but you know, when it comes to Israel and people's judgment toward Israel and to that, towards the United States, there's a little bit of difference. Like for example, when there are attacks against Palestinians or uh, the war last year in Gaza, those are things that steer ordinary Iranians' uh, feelings as well. And you get the, si the same kind of reaction that you might get anywhere else in the world from people who get um, angry over the death of uh, s such great numbers of Palestinians. But you know, the I Iranians have made it clear during dem demonstrations what their position is. Uh, one of the very famous slogans that has been chanted over and over again is, forget about Israel, think about us. So uh, Iranian people are very wary of uh, Iran's involvement uh, in everything that causes uh, uh, the, the conflict between Israel and Palestinians to drag on. Uh, and they prefer to see that focus uh, toward improvement of their own situation inside the country. All right, thank you for being here tonight. Um, so I wanna ask a little bit uh, about your uh, work uh, reporting for New York Times in Iran. Uh, I'm sure some or most of us are familiar with uh, mainstream media in the US uh, and uh, what it has come to. I mean, we can watch CNN for 10 minutes and um, see where it has gone. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you talked about um, how while reporting for the New York Times in Iran, you try to uh, draw this humanizing picture of the people. Um, did you ever find any sort of conflict between the stories that you wanted to write and the things that you wanted to report on uh, and what the New York Times wanted you to focus on? Um, you know, the, was there any kind of conflict between your, the stories that you wanted to talk about and the stories that would sell in the West, specifically in the US? Well, I was their only correspondent uh, based in Tehran. There were other reporters who came and visited from time to time. Uh, who could get visa, uh, depending on if they could get visa. Uh, when I was based uh, in Tehran, I was responsible for two kinds of stories, uh, daily news stories and feature stories. Um, I never pitched a story that the paper ended up, we call it, killing the story. They, I mean, there was huge appetite for any kind of story out of Iran. The most popular stories were the ones that I wrote about life, about a musician's life, about transsexuals life. I mean, I, I wrote the first story about transsexuals and then so many movies uh, were made about it, partly because nobody thought there were transsexuals in Iran and nobody thought that the government supports them. I mean, the regime doesn't support uh, bisexuals or uh, 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 the gays. But transsexuals, yes, that's acceptable in Islam, apparently. <laughs> news stories, they were daily news stories. Anything that um, a wire covered, I almost covered. Um, either I was, I, I found out about it and I wrote it before my editors woke up in New York, or I missed it, they woke up and they told me about it at three o'clock my time, I wrote about it. Um, I never felt that there was a story that I wanted to report and they didn't want to publish, or there was uh, a kind of reporting that they wanted me to do. I think it does depend on um, uh, the person on the ground, how they see uh, the issues. Uh, I sort of take responsibility for whatever uh, was written um, under my byline. Hi, I have a friend who's Iranian and a professor who was in the United States and had to go back in 2007 to take care of his mother. He's quite a leftist and for whatever reason he hasn't been able to come back. And I edited myself when I send him emails and I'm wondering what kinds of things I can and can't discuss with him without getting him in trouble. That's my big fear, I guess. And a second quick question is this expression, death to America or 
or death to Israel. What is it, how does it really translate? And I, I've heard that people say, death to this traffic jam. So is there a, <laughs> is there a connection there, or are we really getting a good translation? So, thank you. Well, I, like, I like that interpretation. <laughs> because the meaning of it doesn't, the literal translation is correct, but I don't think in terms of meaning it goes anything beyond that. Uh, I mean, I don't think anyone would ever take, and you've never come across any Iranian here who has been um, charged with uh, posing any kind of serious threat. Um, I hope not. I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I shouldn't talk about it. Um, about your friend, um, I don't know. I mean, it depends on why he hasn't come back. Uh, I never censored myself when I exchanged emails. I know a lot of people are in contact um, with uh, friends overseas, whether they are Iranian or they're not. Uh, all I can tell you that Iran is not uh, Soviet Union, um, the kind of things that you might think might be dangerous, uh, might not be. Uh, um, so I, I think you can ask him if he's in any kind of trouble and he would tell you. I hope so. Okay, this is um, the last question, I guess, but what, how do you spell the last name of the woman who died, I think it was in 79, and she led the counter movement? I wanted to do some research about her. I don't know how to spell her last name. Um, it, you said in the beginning of the talk, a woman uh, in 1979 was killed? 80, oh. 2009. Oh, 2009? Oh, I thought this was when you were, how did you spell her last name? Yeah, oh, Nadav. Nadav was her first name. Okay. And her family name, Aga, A-G-H-A. A-G-H-A, and her first name? Uh, her first name was Sultan, Neda, but her family name is Aga Sultan. A-G-H-A-S-O-L, Sultan, T-A-N. Oh, okay, so I don't know if she'll be on Google or not. She is on Google. Oh, okay, because yeah. I'd like to know more. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much.